Um, throughout this session, uh, we hope to uh, be enlightened uh, on the current uh, status of the Philippine uh, electricity industry, um, gov especially the government's policy uh, uh, and regulatory directions, uh, which will be shared uh, with us by our colleagues from our government, uh, uh, notably uh, uh, Undersecretary Adrashan Navarro, uh, Undersecretary Jesus uh, uh, <coughs> Posadas, uh, and, and Commissioner uh, 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 yeah, Taro of, of uh, uh, Victoria, Gloria Victoria, I should make sure the full name, Commissioner uh, yeah, Taro of, uh, of the Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, and uh, and uh, we, we are also very much uh, uh, have been, or have already been very much introduced to the concepts of dynamic competition uh, by uh, uh, Steve, Stephen Fuller and, and uh, joining us here are two other experts, uh, uh, our colleague uh, attorney, but actually Dr. Marchego, <laughs> uh, so PhD from the, uh, in competition and economics. Uh, and also uh, our uh, uh, Dr. Francisca Aguero. So I think we'll have a very interesting discussion uh, ahead of us. Uh, we have uh, one hour and 30 minutes, um, but with my long introduction, that's now less than one hour and 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, now um, let me start with uh, my colleagues in, uh, in government. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Under Secretary Navarro, Under Secretary Fosadas, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, Commissioner uh, Tarok to, uh, to share with us how the energy industry um, fits into the whole uh, development uh, plan and long term vision of, uh, of the country. Um, uh, please limit initially your intervention to four minutes each uh, for speaker. Thank you, Commissioner Balisakan. And uh, thank you also for, to the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, I used to be a researcher in the energy sector. My portfolio now is uh, regional development, but uh, I'm really glad that I'm still being invited to uh, discussions like this. Now, uh, on the Philippine, uh, energy, uh, Philippine Development Plan um, and uh, how the energy sector fits in the plan, um, we have uh, end of uh, plan period targets and uh, uh, energy sector development is really one of the top priorities um, of the government. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, the Philippines is now on a high growth trajectory and to sustain that growth, we need large infrastructure investments and uh, uh, energy sector development uh, is uh, uh, one of the uh, um, uh, priorities under infrastructure sector. Uh, the PDP targets uh, by the end of plan period or year 2022 to have met the power requirements at 113%, meaning the available capacity uh, would be 100 113% of the total peak demand and the required reserve. The target level of available capacity by 2022 is uh, 24,248 megawatts from the baseline of uh, 16,791 megawatts. Um, further, the government recognizes uh, the multidimensional benefits of energy access and that's why uh, we are also targeting that uh, by the end of the plan period, or by year 2022, uh, we will be able to promote uh, further um, inclusive growth, especially in rural areas, by raising household electrification to 100%. Right now, uh, the baseline is 89.61% uh, 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 household electrification. The Philippine Development Plan also um, lays down uh, uh, strategies uh, to promote competition or to uh, improve competition and uh, these are as follows. Uh, strengthen the competitive selection process uh, in securing bilateral power supply contracts. 
um, revisit the rules and the regulation on cross ownership between retail and generation or distribution. Uh, foster a more conducive business and the regulatory environment to allow the entry of more generation companies and uh, accelerate uh, this strategy is uh, always occurring in different uh, uh, places in the Philippine Development Plan. Accelerate the business permitting process for energy investment projects. So those are uh, what uh, we aim to do, the whole of government uh, aims to do in uh, uh, energy sector development. And uh, uh, our colleague from uh, the DOE uh, may want to add more. I'll just, I'll just quickly think my prepared answer because they gave me in advance the question. <laughs> the energy industry is made up of the fossil fuels, that is oil, gas, and coal, and the electric power sectors. Both sectors directly affect and are affected by the growth and direction of the economy and therefore are planned and implemented accordingly. Both sectors are both deregulated and privatized. The implementation of roadmaps on energy resource development, downstream operation, electric power transformation, transmission and distribution, energy utilization and retail supply segments are therefore influenced by the private sector's interests. This is where government's provision of energy policy, planning, guidance, and regulation to protect public and consumer interests is needed to balance private sector's interests in the pursuit of national development goals under Ambition 2040. Towards the Philippine power sector's development, the DOE pursues its nine-point agenda, which relates six on the supply side and three on the demand side. On the, on the supply side, we intend to build a portfolio of power plants following the, the, uh, the following categories. 70% base load, 20% mid merit, 10% peaking, following a fuel and technology neutrality. Second, we intend to build 25% reserves as a percentage of peak demand for reliability. This will answer the three areas of reliability. First is transmission and ciliary services. Second is distribution, sector replacement, and backup power. And thirdly, emergency response during calamities. Thirdly, we intend to pursue an integrated LNG project. This is brought about by the expected uh, depletion of the Malampaya reserves beginning 2024. And we have to prepare for importation of liquid natural gas. Number four is the PISA, uh, PISAM assets privatization, which is uh, part of the PIRA law. Number, uh, number five is EO30 energy projects of national significance. This is the executive order which aims to facilitate the processing of energy projects of national significance, which aims to uh, have all of the agencies that are involved in permitting to be in parallel, in parallel order, not following the previous sequential type of permitting, which uh, results in very long uh, permitting periods, which uh, goes up to three, four years. Number six, we intend to pursue a grid connectivity. Today, it's only Luzon and Visayas that are interconnected. We intend to connect Mindanao with the Visayas, with the Visayas grid. This is the Visaya, Visayas Abismid Interconnectivity Project. On the demand side, we intend to uh, pursue 100% household electrification by 2022. Also, we intend to pursue consumer choice to the retail competition open access. And last but not least, but I, I feel very important, is the pursuit of energy efficiency and conservation.
morning, everyone. Um, from the regulator's point of view, there are basically uh, two items that the Commission is um, actively in pursuit of. First is the competitive selection process. Uh, just a way of a background. Um, while there has been a competitive selection process put in place by the Commission sometime in October, sometime in November 2015, this is a result of the joint efforts between the Department of Energy and the, the Energy Regulatory Commission, considering that we were faced with a lot of queries and the legal, legal issues brought forth by uh, the distribution utilities who were then um, already in the middle of their negotiations. When we put in place uh, the competitive selection process, having made it effective a day after its publication, um, there was a point in time when the competitive selection process was in place for a few months, but because we were faced with a lot of legal queries and complications, and in fact we were, um, um, we were, we were receiving a lot of queries from the distribution utilities, and some of them from the electric cooperatives represented even by Philreca, seeking an exemption from the competitive selection process, uh, anchored on the fact that uh, they have already been uh, in the middle of negotiations and they were just about to file their applications for approval of power supply agreements. The Commission had to make a Solomonic decision at, um, by restating the effectivity sometime on March 15, 2016, making, a, making the competitive selection process effective on April 30, 2016. In, effa in, in effect, there was just about a 25 calendar days window by which uh, um, entities that have not undergone competitive selection process to, sub to submit before the Commission their power supply agreements. But nonetheless, um, after April 30, we have already put in place strictly the competitive selection process. And number two, um, number two um, aspect that the Commission is very much uh, involved with is how is the implementation of retail competition and open access. Earlier, um, Dr. Steve Puller was talking about the, um, how to make uh, a dynamic competition in the market, in the electricity market. Uh, the only travail that we are faced with now is in as much as the competition uh, with respect to the retail competition was pushed forward by the regulator, by, by the Energy Regulatory Commission. We were um, very much affected by the wholesale temporary restraining order which was issued by our Supreme Court. Um, the uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce took the position that because we have licensed several um, retail electricity suppliers who would now be catering to the needs of the uh, contestable market, meaning to say one megawatt, uh, at this point in time, our contestable market is about one megawatt, but we were supposed to go into the 750, uh, 750 down to the 500, if not for the fact that we were, as I said earlier, curtailed by the temporary restraining order issued by the uh, Supreme Court, by our Supreme Court. Um, <clears throat> so the, in as much as uh, during that time when the, when the uh, regulation put in place by the Energy Regulatory Commission has not yet been set by the temporary restraining order by uh, the Supreme Court, we noted that in the electricity market, um, our wholesale electricity spot market, that there was already a robust switching. In fact, uh, many contestable customers have already um, um, under have already taken contracts outside of the incumbent, meaning to say the distribution utility. Um, but uh, because of that Supreme Court decision, Supreme Court uh, uh, temporary setback, um, this has not this has been stalled. But um, we are actually faced also with um, with the issue of licensing. But not um, well as we. I think that's a, that, uh, that's a drawback of legal proceedings. Um, while the regulations put in place by the Energy Regulatory Commission has not been decided with finality, meaning to say it has not been um, said to be unconstitutional for being, uh, for being contrary to the spirit of IPIRA, um, still the regulator cannot move forward. But we are actually seeking the intervention of the Supreme Court, and we've had uh, we've filed several several pleadings before the, the Supreme Court to put in place already with finality on whether or not our regulations that were put in place were really contrary to the spirit of IPIRA. Um, uh, maybe uh, just a context on <clears throat> just a context on uh, what these regulations are. Um, well, in the in the Philippine setting, you have a very large. Um, we have about 140 distribution utilities. 120 would be 
on the on-grid areas and uh, on more or less, uh, wait, 120 would be the electric cooperatives and 20 would be your um, private distribution utilities. In the Luzon area alone, you have about, you have the biggest uh, franchise holder, which is actually a mega franchise holder having a 6 million subscriber base. That's for the private distribution utility. And, uh, and the second one is a shy second, which only has about 450,000 subscribers. I'm, I'm speaking of uh, private distribution utilities. And now comparing it to our electric cooperatives, which are non-stock, non-profit, uh, they would have an average of about uh, 150 or 100 uh, subscribers. So if you would see the disparity in the numbers, the regulator is also faced with how to put in regulation. That would not, that would more or less cater um, as best as it could uniformly in terms of fairness and equity to all the distribution utilities. But with this disparity in numbers, we are actually facing quite quite a challenge. Just for the in the in the Metro Manila area alone, um, for example, uh, based on our law, we have um, uh, we have a large distribution utility which caters to more or less forty percent of the gross domestic product uh, compared to other compared to other areas. So, what kind of regulation should now be put in place? Where well, we did we did try to. Um, put in place a regulation uh, by which we have actually said that uh, the incumbent will have to uh, will have to form their own uh, juridical entities to cater to their to cater to their um, uh, captive mark cap to cater to their uh, contestable market, but uh, they took the position that uh, it is not in accord with the IPRA. Um, you see, the IPIRA law should also be taken and appreciated not only in light of the law, but likewise in light of the several franchises granted by Congress to all the distribution utilities. As of now, uh, it is really Congress that, that, that gives the franchise for electric cooperatives and private distribution utilities. And this must be taken into account when, uh, when they take a look at the IPIRA law. And likewise, we have been faced with... Um, well, the consumer groups have always been saying that uh, there is a self-dealing in terms of contracting, but they seem to have been oblivious of the fact that even a PRL law provided for the self-dealing, as, as they say. Uh, under Section 45, there is a provision for cross-ownership, which was earlier mentioned by Mr. Jesse Ang, which is about 50% of the picking demand. But that, is, that has been provided under the law. We may see differences in, uh, uh, we may see challenges in its implementation, However, as regulators, we are mandated to comply with what the law has, has, has said. And earlier, doctor, you spoke about uh, how they now determine market, uh, market power. Is it through the number, uh, is it through the extent of the entity? Not necessarily the case because it may be just a pivotal player would be able to exercise market power. We have also been faced with a challenge under Section 45, which says that the uh, and um, um, the parameters under Section 45 of IPIRA says control and ownership. Um, but uh, when you take a look at our implementing rules and regulations, it speaks of uh, whatever has been sold in the market. So we're actually faced now, the Commission is actually faced with, uh, with the difficulty of how to really implement um, determination of, uh, of market share limitations in line, in line of, the, of the different interpretation based on law and based on uh, and based on the implementing rules and regulations of IPIRA. but as you earlier mentioned, Doctor, um, that what may be the HHI is not necessarily a good indicator because uh, because you said earlier that the pivotal the pivotal uh, market uh, the pivotal generator would really be even if it just uh, exercises a small portion uh, in terms of uh, in terms of being cleared in the market would have higher price and at that particular time. It becomes the peaking plant that uh, that that closes in the um, um, the mark the supply and demand. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner uh, Farrell. Um, let's uh, okay. Okay. Let's uh, let's talk a bit. Uh, 
and put the discussion in, in the context that we, that we can perhaps uh, better understand. Uh, understand. Uh, a decade ago, uh, we have been hearing that, uh, uh, particularly the business sector has been saying that, uh, that the Philippines has the most expensive power uh, uh, among the countries in our region, even comparable to that in Japan. It's a very developed country. Right? Uh, a decade later, we haven't, uh, is the perception is still there, it's the same, it's still the most expensive uh, what has happened, and, and from our view, uh, from the point of view of the, uh, an understanding of the, our uh, 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 people in government, uh, uh, what has really been the, the really most binding constraint that has prevented uh, us from getting those prices down so that our, uh, 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 our uh, industry has become more competitive? Can we start with the... Uh, Yes, Agnawara. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Balisakan. Uh, when we were doing uh, the assessment portion of the Philippine Development Plan, uh, we look at the data again, and uh, yes, that's true. We still have the most expensive uh, electricity in uh, the ASEAN region. Uh, in 2015, uh, we compared uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore with Philippines, and uh, in all sectors, industry, uh, commercial and domestic, uh, we had the highest uh, electricity rates. Um, the um, case of Singapore, uh, Singapore is the country comparable to the power industry that uh, we have. Uh, that country have been uh, liberalized um, uh, market structure. Uh, we're still higher than uh, them. Uh, our rates are still higher than theirs. And um, according to, uh, we also got some figures from the Department of Energy. The average rates of Meralco, uh, although it has declined uh, from second to third highest in Asia, uh, it's still high. And uh, the uh, assessment uh, is pointing to um, the large role of subsidies uh, in these countries. They simply, uh, with the exception of uh, Singapore, of course, they simply have uh, so much subsidies uh, being poured into the energy sector. And the Philippines uh, is uh, highly dependent on imported uh, fuel. But uh, I think um, uh, we can still, uh, there's still room for uh, uh, reducing electricity rates if uh, we will be able to um, improve com competition in the uh, generation sector. And uh, uh, basically, uh, it's the tight supply uh, that is uh, leading to uh, certain uh, occurrences of uh, exercise of market power and that is also exacerbated by the transmission capacity constraint. And uh, when uh, uh, going around the uh, regions across the country, because uh, I supervise um, 15 uh, NEDA regional offices, uh, that reliability of power supply because of um, insufficient generation capacity in some areas and uh, tight uh, or in uh, unreliable uh, transmission capacity uh, and performance, um, especially when uh, typhoons occur or earthquakes uh, occur, like uh, uh, what happened um, in, uh, recently in the Visayas, which affected the Bohol Island uh, grid. Uh, that, that issue on gen cost. Um, insufficient capacity and uh, transmission uh, weaknesses, uh, those issues are uh, frequently surface. Uh, now what's needed in the regions, as uh, we also um, included in the Philippine Development Plan, um, are of course uh, uh, improved uh, business uh, permit uh, processing for the GENCOS and the uh, transmission uh, uh, providers uh, operate and operators um, investment. Uh, in Luzon, a uh, transmission network improvement uh, is needed to support uh, generation capacity additions in Quezon, uh, Bataan, and Zambales areas. And there's also a need to complement the transmission loop across uh, Metro Manila. Major island grid connections are also needed, particularly uh, Palawan, uh, Mindanao grid connection to the mainland uh, Luzon. In Visayas, the three-stage implementation of transmission backbone uh, has to be uh, implemented. Cebu to Panay Island uh, to ensure full dispatch of both conventional and renewable energy. 
uh, Cebu to Bohol. Uh, these islands are more familiar to us Filipinos. <laughs> Cebu to Bohol uh, interconnection uh, to improve the reliability of uh, supply in Bohol, which is a growing tourism area. And uh, of course, uh, Visayas Mindanao uh, interconnection as a uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Yusek Posadas. That's all I have to contribute for now. I have many things to say about regional yeah. development, but <laughs> we lack time. We have more time. Uh, uh, do you have anything to add, uh, Yusek Posadas, from the point of view of the, uh, of the OE? Well, actually, I, I, I fully confirm what the Neda Yusek stated. But just, me, just let me read what I have uh, prepared as an answer. The Philippine power rates covering residential, commercial, and industry are really the highest in Asia, but, it has, but is at par with Singapore. This may be attributed to the absence of government subsidies, unlike in other Asian countries like Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia. It is only the Philippines and Singapore which has adopted true cost pricing, i.e. following market pricing without government price support except for identified class of socially disadvantaged consumers. Using the Philippines as a benchmark, as of June this year, uh, Thailand on the residential is 20% lower, Indonesia is 30% lower, Malaysia is 50% lower. Singapore is 2% lower. Vietnam is 40% lower. Let's go to the commercial. The commercial rates, again using the Philippines as a benchmark, Thailand is 35% lower. Indonesia is 26% lower. Malaysia is 44% lower. Singapore is 8% lower. And Vietnam is 32% lower. On the industrial side, Thailand is 20% lower, Indonesia is 4% lower, Malaysia is 30% lower, Singapore is 18% higher. That's one of the areas that uh, we beat Singapore. Thailand is 40% lower. As in other ASEAN countries, competition is hindered by monopoly. Where control and management of generation, transmission, distribution assets are in the hands of one entity, for example, the state. An enabling factor for competition is, is where the generation, transmission, distribution, and supply are in the control and management of a sufficient number of independent private companies. Sufficiency of supply in the whole power value chain is prerequisite to enabling competition. In the Philippine upstream resource development of our indigenous coal, oil, and gas, which support security and adequacy of power supply and the fuel end of the power value chain, the government implements a transparent and competitive scheme to the Philippine Conventional Energy Contracting Program. Its salient features are adopting a nomination-based contracting and licensing scheme, Compliance of milestone work commitments, compliance to legal, te technical, and financial qualifications under specific guidelines of requirements and criteria, introduction of marginal field as part of the available areas for petroleum, implementation of an expeditious awarding process all year round. Okay. Uh we are running a bit of time, uh, but uh, uh, I, we really would want to take advantage of the presence of our uh, uh, resource persons here. So let us turn uh, to, to, to the international uh, setting. Uh, you have heard the, the, the problems facing our uh, sector uh, and the Philippine economy, electricity being a binding constraint. What, from your views, uh, we have heard, of course, the uh, it is very useful for for the Philippines by way of reform and prioritizing the reforms. In particular, uh, uh, where are the likely uh, 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 easy cases for, uh, for you know, reducing the cost, uh, at least in the short run, and in the longer term, 
what uh, to do. Is there a, uh, for example, a this distinction between generation uh, uh, and and, uh, and retail uh, uh, reform, uh, competition reform? Uh, in the context of your understanding now, the Philippines, uh, where where we where are the easy easy wins? So. Um, I am not an expert in the electricity sector. I work on competition and I'm part of the global team on competition policy of the World Bank. So I'm basically going to bring some exciting new data that uh, covers uh, uh, the electricity sector, the energy sector in, in the Philippines, but also thinks about what are the types of uh, restrictions that uh, are present in key sectors of the economy, specifically uh, network industries. So if, if my slides could be projected, that would be very good. But until then, let me tell you that what we observe is, let me talk to you a little bit about the exercise that we have done. The World Bank Group has worked together with the OECD in order to look into uh, product market regulations in the Philippines. And product market regulation indicators is um, actually an indicator of how restrictive uh, to competition, product markets are. Uh, this is a work that we have done together with the OECD, as I said, and uh, Philippines is one of the non-OECD uh, countries for which we have provided this type of information. And interestingly enough, what we observe in my slides, that are not yet there, but let me advance you what we observe, is that Philippines is a slightly above the average of the PMR uh, countries captured in this database. So what we basically see is that while the average, uh, because I have it here, is around 1.90, what we observe is that the Philippines is uh, slightly more restrictive at uh, 2.36, and um, the way PMR works, PMR looks into uh, three types of uh, blocks that actually make for these restrictions the existence of a state control, the existence of barriers to trade and investment, and the existence of what uh, it's, it's called barriers to entrepreneurship, which would be uh, barriers to entry and rival. Okay, so in terms of uh, overall, if we look at the key sectors in the Philippines, what we observe is that uh, Philippines is uh, slightly above the average. Um, okay. <laughs> And let me tell you something else about the PMR. Uh, product market regulation indicators are indicators that are cons uh, built on the basis of the regulation itself. This is a caveat that is important to take into account because they take into account what is written in the law, basically what is written on the books and not necessarily the implementation and not necessarily the practice. So what we see here, and this would be the other slide, well, it doesn't matter, this slide is, if, if, we, if we see the previous slide, that would be good. Okay, finally, an illustration of what I was discussing. So what we see here is that Philippines uh, is, is to the left, as I said, is a, is slightly above the average, and is definitely uh, uh, more restrictive than other comparators, such as, for instance, uh, Romania, Poland, or uh, Chile. Um, but in the context, uh, please next slide. In the context of uh, the electricity sector, what we can actually see is that because of EPIRA, because of this very ambitious regulatory reform, what you what you see here is that Philippines is one of the top performers. Is together with Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, and out of the while the average of the restrictions that we see uh, among the PMR data set is around 3.10, in Philippines it's only 1.92. This is very low. So on the one hand, you know, you should congratulate yourselves in the sense that you have created a regulatory framework that is top performance. And as, as my colleague from IFC was saying, you know, everywhere in the world where you go, they know about the PIRA and they know uh, uh, what is going on. If we land a little bit more into the type of restrictions that we see here are basically related with, hmm, lack, I mean, with vertical integration and with the lack of vertical, uh, with the fact that there is a still vertical integration to a lesser extent, public ownership, and then even to a lesser extent, energy. But is it that we observe? Is it what we can see in reality? 
because you yourself were saying, I mean, prices are very high. Capacity is not, uh, especially if we look at capacity, please next slide, at capacity per capita is uh, among the lowest in the region. And if we look into the vertical integration issue or vertical separation, what we see, uh, and this, the upper, the upper pies are uh, coming from the PMR data set, what we see is that most countries have either legal or accounting separation in terms of the vertical separation for generation, while the vertical separation in distribution, uh, even less countries have no separation, as, as is the case of Philippines. So, it's interesting to see that you have a very advanced regulatory framework, but the reality is not following this regulatory framework. And, and why is this interesting? Because from a competition perspective, and now let me just step back and look at it from a competition perspective, the idea is that there have to be other conditions that are having, do have an impact in the fact that prices remain high and capacity uh, remains low. Because the idea is that competition policy is an ecosystem. Competition policy is not about looking at a sector in isolation, but looking at how the different regulations and implementation interact with each other. So certain issues that, of course, we all know that can be problematic is not only the, the, the question of uh, vertical separation in generation and distribution, but also the fact that there are uh, FDI restrictions in, in utilities, and this is definitely uh, a constraint to attract the necessary capital for for infrastructure development, the fact that there, there is a cross-subsidiation between in-grid customers and off-grid customers, and the fact that even if there is third-party access, the third-party access is not regulated, it's negotiated, and there have been complaints in relation to the implementation of the third-party access. So at the end of the day, what we see is that the PIDA has really pushed the limits on, on regulation towards deregulation and trusting what are going to be the, the, market, uh, the market forces. But on the other hand, what we see is that the market hasn't picked up. And I, don't want, I want to leave my colleagues give their opinions on why this can be. But in general, uh, let's think proactively and positively about the, the type of uh, instruments that the Philippines have. And although there are some problems, and, uh, we don't, we don't need to go there, but obviously the, the, the fact that there is a, a, a market share restriction can be a problem if we look at the existence of this market share restriction in connection with the fact that prices are not regulated and, and so on. Uh, you also have the ability to look at the competition ecosystem from a holistic perspective because you have a, competition, a national competition policy. The fact that the Philippines has a national competition policy and that the role of NEDA and the role of the PCC to look at the competition ecosystem uh, cohesively and holistically is the type of, um, of instrument that can be implemented to uh, foster more competition in the uh, electricity sector, not so much focusing just on the existence of market power or not, but focusing on how the different bits and pieces interact with each other and actually result in more efficient or less efficient market outcomes. So. Okay, thank you, Gracia. It's very inform uh, informative data. Uh, let me turn to, 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 uh, to Francisco. I, 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 I think the, the uh, Chile experience uh, uh, very useful to hear. What do you think is the, the uh, from the point of view of the Chilean experience and, uh, and, and uh, power reform um, thank for you. the Philippines? Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you all for the for the invitation and the secretaries that are here present. Uh, well, the Chilean experience is we have almost thirty five years of regulatory reform, we were one of the first countries to, to start these kind of reforms and uh, it is certainly a pleasure to, to look at, uh, at how the, the Philippine regulation is, the APIRA, as, as you were saying. But as Graciela was saying, uh, sometimes uh, the devil is in the details and how is these laws are implemented. implemented sorry. Um, first, uh, the, there are certainly, as, as the, the, the Vishnu was saying, many, many objectives, many uh, Duties that uh, electricity regulation have competition is one of the, one of the purposes, but certainly other issues such as fairness, security, uh, even a low carbon economy uh, start to to uh, distract and 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 change this this pure competition uh, policy framework that we could uh, apply in other industries. Certainly, um, 
but uh, if despite the, 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 the excellent or the very good regulation um, that, that you have, uh, the, the, the key question for me is how that this, uh, how there are so so uh, high prices, uh, how, how you can get a reduction of these high prices, no? Um, well, in my country we had uh, high prices for, for a while, uh, this was certainly because, as uh, you see in my presentation, uh, my, uh, our economy was, uh, electricity generation was, was uh, related to uh, hydroelectric projects. Uh, we have a strong uh, opposition from communities, local communities, but also from, from fossil fuels. Huh? So our dependence from fossil fuels uh, for electricity generation uh, brought us very, very high prices for a while. So uh, my country started a reform uh, almost 12 years ago, uh, but focusing not on competition, but on reliability and security of supply. We didn't have the supply for a while. Uh, our, our largest provider of natural gas, Argentina, which is a neighbor country, uh, stopped its transport and supply of gas for our country. So many natural gas projects that have started uh, working, actually, uh, had to stop and change it to diesel. Uh, so our prices uh, raised for a while. So uh, the regulation started to promote first security of supply, trying to bring new new generation, but also uh, didn't work properly. Uh, it didn't it actually prices went went, went high, as we will see in my presentation later. So the recent regulation has said, well, how can we introduce more competition? Uh, there are certainly entry barriers. Our, our generation sector was concentrated in three actors. Uh, we have no no market share restrictions there, but. Uh, how can we bring more competition in order to reduce prices? And we have been uh, successful in a way for a while, certainly. Uh, and uh, a new tendering process concentrating in more rivals has, uh, has been in place. Uh, uh, the details uh, in the first tendering process were uh, focused in not, not in competition, as I was saying, but in security of supply. So uh, incumbent actors uh, got the best uh, contracts for a while. This has influenced a lot. They didn't uh, be uh, competitive, actually. So uh, this uh, has brought new new reforms in, in tendering. Has brought uh, certainly more arrivals, uh, almost a hundred and something uh, new new actors, uh, small actors uh, in renewable energies. Uh, uh, some geothermal, geothermal, sorry even some Philippine investment in, ge in geothermal, uh, but also in solar and, and wind, uh, wind farms. So, so this has been a, an area to, to study. Um, but also, um, the, the, the purpose of, of cross-subsidizing uh, isolated yeah, generators uh, and, generate, and isolated uh, distribution may, may distract and, and, and alter the pricing system. So, so you may try to uh, focus on uh, focusing on the poorest uh, consumers there, or or trying to promote efficient innovate and, and innovative uh, technologies in those isolated areas. So that's going to be an, an area to, to study. Uh, we were looking at Graciela to the regulation. We're not a, an expert, although we are lawyers. We don't uh, we're not experts in the, in the implementation of, of your regulations and. Regulate related party contracts may also be a problem there, so so you may have to study. Uh, and that's my, my first uh, look at the, the regulation. Uh, certainly, third party access are also relevant uh, uh, for new and new entrants. Uh, so so there probably even regulation can be a, a good, a good uh, tool. Um, and finally, uh, the the contestable market for one megawatt users. Uh, uh, this sounds very similar to us because uh, 35 years ago in Chile we had a contestable market for 2 megawatt users. Uh, contra intuitively, our results were not good there. Uh, uh, liberalized users uh, actually didn't get the best prices there, so they had tried to camouflage and seem to appear or try to appear as regulated users because their prices that they obtained were very high. They were higher than buying at, at the distribution company. So regulation there, uh, a couple of years ago, changed it in order to say that the contestable market is not for 2 megawatt consumers, users actually, sorry, but 5 megawatt consumers. It went up the, the level. In order, and now that has created more competition there because they cannot camouflage their, their actual consumption. Uh, 
so that's not very uh, usual to understand. That's very common, but uh, it has brought uh, better results because now we have also more more uh, generators offering better prices to these uh, unregulated consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, Steve, let me come back to uh, get back to you. Uh, given what uh, uh, we have heard, and there are actually more puzzles now than <laughs> than resolution. Uh, first, uh, we were uh, uh, earlier saying that uh, that the cost of power in this country is very high compared to our neighbors, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Rachel's, uh data indicate that you actually have relatively low PMR, uh, especially in the in the power sector. Uh, although I uh, recognize that the scoring system is probably based on a de jure uh, a de jure basis, not on the actual uh, conditions uh, or the parameters. Uh, 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 yet uh, uh, the basic question then is. Uh, is uh, are these high prices then the result of anti-competitive practices, or they are simply the result of the fact that, as Sek, uh, Yusek, uh, uh, or Adora was saying, that all these other countries are highly subsidizing uh, uh, power? Let me get back to you to the issue of this efficiency versus equity. Uh, we were saying earlier that you have to separate the two. Our if our other neighbors are not separating the two, uh, insofar as oh, you know, uniformly subsidizing, uh, where's what do you recommend for the Philippines? It looks like the the, the PFR data of Graciela is like putting us in the in the league of developed countries. You know, it's, it's like like behaving behaving a developed country rather than a, a, you know, one of our ASEAN countries. Steve, would you comment on Right, so I, I had some, somewhat of a similar reaction too in trying to understand you know, what, what the driver is of the, the high costs and how much of the subsidies. I, I think, you know, in general, in, you know, especially resource-rich developing uh, countries have mm -hmm. often uh, granted really high subsidies, right? And in some ways, that can backfire if, in fact, then the government finds themselves in a position where they're constantly trying to support these subsidies. They're basically selling it you know, negative margins, and then they're thinking, okay, how, how can we possibly try to induce conservation? Um, you know, I think a, a second point that I'd like to make, you know, thinking about the spot market uh, and rooms for uh, regulation uh, or oversight to ensure competition. You know, in general with these spot markets, I think you can think of kind of two tiers of oversight. One is kind of an ex-ante, upfront oversight how do, you, um, how do you organize the structure? What kind of structural remedies uh, can you put in place so that firms won't have, those generation firms won't have the incentive to exercise market power? So that's kind of the front end, structural remedies. And then more of the back end is actually analyzing the actual competition ex post in the spot market, um, looking at the bids, seeing if they seem competitive, thinking about what bid mitigation rules you could put in place either to punish those that bid too high, or in some jurisdictions you kind of come in an ex post, you reset the bids if you think, for example, it was, uh, it was an anti-competitive bid or it was happening because of a unique circumstance, say because of transmission congestion. So maybe I could ask the commissioner uh, a question. Um, what, in terms of the, the antitrust law, what sort of flexibility does it provide you either on the front end with the structural remedies or on the back end with um, with bid mitigation. Yeah, uh, yeah I think Graciela uh, <laughs> step further. So, uh, yeah. Uh. Actually, in the in the Philippine setting, we have um, in the spot market, we have an offer cap. Um, initially, um, at this at the time when it was when the spot market was put in place in two thousand six. It was based on the um, on the most expensive plant, uh, with a with a um, I think with a av availability capacity of only five percent. So it would be a scarcity pricing. It was at six to two thousand. But sometime in twenty thirteen or twenty fourteen, we have reduced it to thirty two thousand. Another uh, another uh, another measure that was put in place by the commission, although 
we have received a lot of criticisms on this on this particular regulation. Um, we have actually put in place a secondary bid, a, sec a secondary cap. Uh, well, the gener generation sector is saying that uh, it is actually a disincentive. But uh, as far as the commission is concerned, um, I think the difficulty that a regulator faces is that uh, under IPIRA, it has to fiscalize the interest of both the investor and the consumer. When we put in place the secondary bid cap, it was more uh, it was more to uh, more more in place. Uh, it was put in place rather to to ensure the protection of consumers. Considering that, um, well, as Graciela pointed out earlier, we were acting. We are actually acting like a developed country in terms of uh, pro pro uh, pro competitive measures. Um, but we but we are in reality not yet that a developed country. But I'd just like to add up um, uh, Chair Balisakan earlier. I think one of the things that has not really been spoken of, um, maybe this can, this, can be, this can be the subject of further, further study. If you, compare other, if you compare the Philippines to other countries, the Philippines has actually made a bold step when it put in place IPIRA. It has actually restructured the industry. Whereas in other countries, um, as uh, evidence would show, they're still very much uh, vertically integrated. Thailand, for that matter, has, has its own uh, financing, a GOCC that, uh, that does contracting for its, uh, for its power, power, power sector. It's, it's, uh, it goes more into a, like an IPP, whereas the Philippines under IPIRA um, has, doesn't have that particular flexibility. So our IPIRA is basically um, private sector driven, putting in generation assets is, uh, is private sector driven. And also at the same time, um, our our costs are really fully reflective. Um, also, we also have to take into account, uh, as you said earlier, you take a look at the electricity industry, not from a vacuum, but from a long spectrum. Similar to other sectors, utility, utilities, for example, water. You did not have a 24-7 water at that time, but now you have a 24-7 water service. And I, when in most in most areas in the Philippines, except at the time when there were still blackout blackouts or brownouts in the island of Pindanao, um, you would have encounter um, un, um, dis disruptions in the service. But as we speak now, you can you can you can more or less say on a general plane that you have a twenty four seven electricity service for the most part of uh, for the most part of those on the on grid areas. And how did we get into this? Since it's not just a generation-driven part as part of a retail rate, you also have to improve your capital expenditures to, to address your system's reliability, your system's loss, and then your voltage regulation. When a period was put in place, the commission, um, uh, the commission had oversight, and it still has oversight over the, over the um, distribution management committee and the grid management committee. So when IPIRA was put in place, we put uh, the regulation with respect to technical compliance on the distribution code and the, and the grid management uh, code was put in place. And putting reliability also um, as part of your service entails cost. So that is also part of your retail rate. So it's not, when you take a look at retail rate, it's not just, a, well, in the Philippines it's about 50 to 55 percent is generation. The rest is would, the rest would be your uh, production cost for distribution. But likewise, you also have to take into account that um, we have a lot of non-prod costs based on Epira. We have a preferential option for the poor, where you where you provide missionary electrification, and that's part of the universal charge. So that the non-prod cost also contributes to the retail rate. But that is, a, I think that is a price that a developing country has to pay in order to provide inclusive growth. So um, I think we also have to take a look at that. Okay, uh, maybe we can, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner. Yeah, yeah, Graciela, yeah. I, maybe I can respond to the, to the question. Actually, the rather than respond, I have a couple of questions myself. <laughs> And, and they go a little bit in the, in the in in the same direction. Like I, I would like to know what do you think about the fact that the regulatory powers of the of the commission have been questioned, 
and how do you think that that actually influences the outcomes that we are observing in the market? The fact that you were saying, yeah, there have been so so many, I mean, certain complaints regarding uh, third-party access, there have been certain complaints before the Supreme Court, and at the end of the day, I think uh, the, the whole, as you were pointing out before, the whole concept of HIPIRA is also the spirit of the law and what was intended with it, and one needs to look at it holistically. So how, what are the visions for for this particular aspect, and how do you think this is influencing the, the market outcomes? Um, if under the law, the, the Energy Regulatory Commission was envisioned to be independent. We know very well that when there is a politics involved in utility regulation, that is actually where we face a lot of challenge. And um, being independent would really be I mean, the decisions of the commission have far-reaching um, implications. Like, for example, in terms of capex, uh, cap capital expenditure for for uh, strengthening the grid. Um, the benefits of strengthening the grid, whether it's distribution grid or the transmission grid, cannot be felt today, but it will be felt five or ten years from now. So, um, the commission, in as much as it would like to exercise independence, always has to always has to um, uh, always has to look into the the, uh, the, the, the the gamut of stakeholders whose interests are not really aligned um, for example the Department of Energy would like to have reliability supply security but that would entail cost and as far as consumers are concerned as I've said earlier ours is fully cost reflective um, there is no subsidy. It's really the consumers who pay for this. So uh, maybe a case in point is that um, the, um, when it comes to contracting, if I were an electric cooperative, I'd like to provide reliability. But um, I know that uh, my supply, um, the customer profile cannot really afford it. So is it all right to have one hour of brownout or to have 24-7 service? If I do not want a one hour of brownout, I have to contract at least more than what is needed so that I could have reserve. But um, that would entail cost, and that are, those are the things that you need to um, you need to um, inform your consumers. But considering that electricity is a grudge buy, um, consumers would really consume and consume. But when it comes on when it comes to payment for the cost they actually cringe. So that's also something that we, uh, well, especially, for, especially in our country, um, they would like to consume more, but they're not willing to pay for that additional cost. 